eastern Georgian Bay, with 30,000 islands, thousands of kilometers of shoreline, rock barrens, forests, hundreds of lakes, and thousands of wetlands, there is an incredible variety of habitat and wildlife found on this coast. Georgian Bay's wetlands are among the highest quality on the Great Lakes and provide important nesting areas for birds, turtles, and amphibians. This area is one of the most biologically diverse regions in the province. It is globally recognized by the United Nations as a World Biosphere Reserve. Our reserve covers 347,000 hectares of shoreline and adjacent lands stretching from the Severn to the French River. Residents and visitors treasure this extraordinary landscape. It is a place where people enjoy being outdoors. This area is also home to a number of species at risk. A species at risk is any native plant or animal that is at risk of extinction or of disappearing from our province. There are almost 200 species at risk in Ontario and more than 30 are found in this area. Why should we be concerned? Plants and wildlife depend on healthy habitat. We also depend on habitats such as wetlands and forests to filter the air and clean our water. When species become endangered, it can indicate that the health of these essential ecosystems is at risk. In fact, the loss of habitat is one of the main reasons that species are at risk today. Other significant threats include road mortality, competition with invasive species, over-harvesting, and pollution. You can help these species remain a part of Georgian Bay's landscape by learning how to identify at-risk species and the habitats they need. By learning more, you can better recognize the actions you can take to help these at-risk species recover. This program will introduce you to several threatened and endangered reptiles and amphibians that may be found in the area that you work, live, or cottage. Do you have any wetlands in your area? Marshes, bogs, fens, swamps, and even small seasonal pools are important wetland habitats. Have you heard this sound in the spring? This is the mating call of the threatened western chorus frog. Vernal or spring pools are important habitat for these small frogs and other amphibians. These pools form during spring melts and typically dry up by summer. Try to keep these areas natural by leaving cover such as logs, stones or leaf litter to provide cover for threatened amphibians like the chorus frog. Turtles, like this threatened Blanding's turtle, need larger wetlands this medium-sized turtle is easily recognized by its bright yellow throat and helmet-like shell. It prefers shallow wetlands and quiet protected coves with lots of aquatic plants. Blanding's turtles can also travel several kilometers over land in search of food, a mate, or a place to lay eggs. Unfortunately, this makes them more likely to be killed on our roads and this has led to their threatened status. It takes a female Blanding's 14 to 25 years to reach maturity, so the loss of any egg-laying turtles has serious consequences for the population. If you see a turtle on the road, and it is safe for you, please move the turtle off the road in the direction it was heading. Please do not take turtles home or try to move them somewhere else. Fortunately, the endangered spotted turtle is still found around Georgian Bay. This turtle is small, with adults only reaching 13 centimeters or about 5 inches. It is easily identified by the round yellow polka dots on its smooth black shell. The spotted turtle spends most of its life in small ponds, bogs, and grassy marshes. Females nest in shallow soil, under moss and leaf litter on rock outcrops, and in sphagnum hummocks. 
Another threatened turtle found in our area is the stink pot or eastern musk turtle. Unlike other turtles, you will seldom see a stink pot basking. They are best recognized by small size, two yellow stripes on the side of their head, an oval smooth domed dark shell, and two small whiskers on their chin. Stink pots prefer shallow still water with plenty of aquatic plants. They rarely leave the water, spending much of their time walking along the bottom, feeding on crustaceans and insects. This makes them especially vulnerable to injury or death from outboard motors operating in shallow water. Unfortunately, increasing numbers of raccoons and skunks impact all turtles in Ontario by eating their eggs. You can help by putting all garbage in an animal-proof container and managing compost carefully. Like many human residents, the eastern fox snake has a strong connection to the shores of Georgian Bay. Fox snakes are usually found within one kilometer of the bay and range from Honey Harbor to Key River. They can swim long distances and are excellent climbers. Young fox snakes eat frogs and insects while the adults prefer rodents, bird eggs, and nestlings. The eastern fox snake can be 80 to 140 centimeters long, so approaching five to six feet long as an adult. The diagnostic features on this snake um, is the, the yellow coloration with the dark brown blotches along the back, uh, along the back and along the sides of the snake. The fox snake is a constrictor, so it's not a venomous species. It's not dangerous at all to people. Uh, it's only dangerous to chipmunks, mice, small birds. With its short pointed tail, the fox snake will mimic the rattlesnake by vibrating its tail rapidly. And if it contacts something like dry vegetation, it can make a convincing rattle-like sound. Fox snakes are communal hibernators, so they, you can get a lot of them going down the exact same hole. This is one of the hibernation spots that we found at Kill Bear after we tracked snakes with radio transmitters. It's on a, a south-facing slope, fairly close to the bay. We're only 30, 40 meters away from, uh, from the shoreline. And the, the fox snakes look for a spot where they can get below the, uh, the frost line. The eastern fox snake is considered endangered federally and threatened provincially. The fox snake is increasingly at risk due to habitat loss and being killed by people, cars, or boats. 70% of the global range of the eastern fox snake is in Ontario, and Georgian Bay is critical to its survival. Two especially important places are hibernation and nursery sites. Creating a leaf and branch pile in a sunny corner of your property may help to make the perfect fox snake nursery. And please report any sightings of groups or numbers of fox snakes to the Parry Sound Office of the Ministry of Natural Resources, as there may be a hibernation site nearby. The eastern hognose snake is often known as the puff adder or blow adder because of its impressive defensive behaviors. If threatened, they may flare their neck like a cobra, hiss loudly, or even strike towards you, though it's usually with a closed mouth. Sometimes they even roll onto their back and play dead with their tongue hanging out. But it's all part of a big bluff. This snake is not venomous. Unfortunately, some people still believe this harmless snake is dangerous. This is one reason for its threatened status. Loss of habitat and being killed on roads are other factors. The eastern hognose snake has an upturned snout, can grow up to a meter in length, and varies tremendously in color, from pale yellow to gray to brown or even black. They have a distinctive dark long spot stretching along both sides of their neck, which becomes noticeable if they flatten their head. They prefer habitats that include sandy soils, rocky areas, and light forest cover. Since they feed mainly on toads, they rely on wetlands for their prey. Eastern Georgian Bay is home to the largest land area in Canada where we can still find the Massasauga rattlesnake. This threatened species is the only venomous snake in Ontario. Unfortunately, People have sometimes killed rattlesnakes because of the perceived threat. 
In reality, they are unlikely to bite unless provoked. One of the first steps in Massasauga conservation is learning how to identify the rattlesnake. The Massasauga has a distinct body shape. The neck is quite narrow in contrast with a wide head and thick body. A typical adult is between 50 and 75 centimeters in length, with the occasional rattlesnake reaching a meter. The background color is gray to brownish gray with dark bow tie shaped blotches sitting like saddles along the back and several rows of alternating blotches along the sides. The tail is thick and has a distinct brownish rattle. The Massasauga may rattle a warning if you move too close or it might just stay still and rely on its coloration to stay hidden. The rattle is only a warning not an indication the snake is prepared to bite. These timid, non-aggressive snakes would rather be left alone than risk an interaction with a predator or person. Now that you can recognize the Massasauga, it is also important to recognize its habitat needs. Massasaugas throughout their life cycle use a number of different types of habitats. Two of the most important ones are hibernation sites where they overwinter and areas where the females go when they're pregnant to incubate their young. These are usually in rock barrens. Um, we're standing in a conifer swamp, an important hibernation habitat for the Massasauga. What we have here is we have a water table that's very close to the surface and hummocks that allow the snakes to move up and down with the fluctuating water levels. In addition to conifer swamps, Massasaugas often hibernate in shrubby swamps, bogs, or depressions in rock that support a few sparse trees. Massasaugas can hibernate on their own or in small groups. They will return to the same site each year, so hibernation sites are considered essential habitat. The areas where pregnant females go to give birth are also considered a vital habitat need. These sites often have large flat rocks and are exposed to the sun. The rocks are usually surrounded on several sides by low-lying shrubs or grasses. Here's an excellent example of where a, a female Massasauga will go and incubate her young. They choose an area that will provide them lots of heat and also a place to get away from predators. Rattlesnakes give live birth in late July to mid-August with an average of 12 young in a brood. A female rattlesnake reaches maturity at about five years old and gives birth likely every two to three years. The young look like smaller versions of the adult it is important to remember that young rattlesnakes do have venom. Rattlesnakes feed mainly on small rodents and need a variety of habitats to meet their food needs. These are often areas like beaver meadows, fields, open forests, or edges of marshes. By being aware of your surroundings and following a few precautions, you can safely share habitat with the Massasauga. Wear protective footwear and long pants, especially when hiking at night or in open rocky areas through brush or long grass. Use a flashlight when traveling at night or reaching into dark places. Always watch where you are putting your hands and feet. Poke around gently with a stick before reaching into brush, under rocks, or into dark places where snakes may be hiding. Keep pets on leashes. Curious pets are more likely to encounter a snake than people are. If you hear a rattlesnake, stay calm. Stop walking and then determine the snake's location. Slowly move away from the snake and give it room to retreat. Enjoy the unique encounter, but observe it from a distance and try not to disturb the snake. Teach young children to tell an adult if they see a snake. Snake bites seldom happen especially if these simple safety precautions are taken. It is important to keep the risk in perspective. Typically, there are only four or five bite incidents each year. The Massasauga is a small snake with a striking distance limited to half its body length. And although the venom is potent, the venom glands and fangs are small and unlikely to penetrate boots or loose clothing. A snake may make a dry, defensive bite and no venom is injected. This happens about 25% of the time. In the rare case of a Massasauga bite, 
it is essential that you know what to do. If you get bitten by a rattlesnake in the field, the most important thing to do is to stay calm. Don't panic. Um, panicking is only going to increase your heart rate and if, you, if the snake injected venom, then it's going to spread the venom throughout your body, which we don't want happening. What you want to do is get them to lie flat and as I mentioned, don't panic, stay calm, um, keep reassuring them. Arrange for transportation to the hospital. Um, you also want to remove any jewelry because chances are that where they've been bitten it's going to start to swell. So before the swelling occurs, start removing the jewelry. You want to apply a splint loosely um, and keep the injury below the level of the heart if that's possible. Cleanse the wound and always, always, always seek medical treatment. A lot of people think that you should apply ice, that you should apply a tourniquet, or you should cut the wound and suck the poison out. Never do any of these things. You're only going to cause further damage. The best thing that you can do is to stay calm and seek medical assistance. Please do not attempt to capture the snake or bring it to the hospital. This is not necessary and has the potential to do more harm. The antivenin is most effective if administered within four to six hours after the bite. The last fatality in Ontario linked to snake bite occurred in 1962, and that person did not receive timely medical attention. In the unlikely event of a bite, a full recovery can be expected with appropriate treatment. Our Provincial Endangered Species Act provides protection to the Massasauga and other species listed as endangered or threatened on the Ontario Species at Risk list. Under this act, it is illegal to harm these species or their habitat. In addition, the Federal Species at Risk Act provides legislation to prevent wildlife species from becoming extinct and to provide for their recovery across Canada. As a landowner, please be aware that the act applies to aquatic species and migratory birds listed as threatened or endangered under the Act. You can take actions to help maintain and restore wildlife habitat on your property. The simplest action is to keep the area around your home or cottage in its natural state. Minimize lawns and choose plant species native to this area. Ensure that shorelines and wetlands, large or small, are preserved. Keep learning about the wildlife in your area and how you can coexist. If other residents join us in these actions, together we can foster healthy, natural neighborhoods. Taking care of the health of our land and water is important for the well-being of wildlife, ourselves, and future generations of Georgian Bay residents.